Hello and welcome. War. War never changes. Three months ago, unfortunately, another ugly war started in Ukraine. And as some of you noticed, I didn't release any videos all this time. In the last three months, I put all my spare time trying to help both Ukrainians running from this terrible war and Russians running from the devastating regime which showed its disgusting face end of February. All these months, nor did I have any time for my hobbies, neither was I able to go on with my normal life. However, meanwhile I am mentally very tired and just have to do something what would bring me to another thought, just not to get insane. My hobby always helped me to get rid of depressive thoughts and so here we go again. In this video I'd like to continue with the upgrade of my Windows XP AGP machine which I started right before the war. The system was waiting for its comeback all this time, sitting on the table. This is a machine which I built some time ago and in the previous part I upgraded the system from a Socket 754 mainboard to a Socket 939. So if you missed or forgot that, feel free to watch the prequels. The last part ended with the conclusion that this ATI Radeon X1650 is a bottleneck in my system. Luckily I found this ATI Radeon HD 3650 AGP graphics card on eBay for only a couple of euros. This is definitely not the fastest AGP graphics card, but at least a faster and a more recent one. As far as I know, this card was released with DDR3 memory as well, but this is just a DDR2 version. Still I expect a reasonable performance improvement compared to the X1650. I tested the card briefly already and it seems to work, but before I really do anything with it, I would like to take a look at the cooler. First of all, this cooler must have been added to this card by a previous owner. This is how the original card should look like. It was equipped with a much smaller black single slot cooler. On this card, however, uh, there is this golden sapphire much taller cooler which is probably better than the original one, but there is something I don't like about it. Well, first of all, I'd prefer to have a single slot cooling on this card. I'm not going to overclock it anyway, and the Mini ATX mainboard has only three PCI slots, where one would be occupied by this GPU cooler already. Second, the cooler doesn't fit well and is pushing against the capacitor a little bit. That is not nice as well, and maybe I can do something about it. Furthermore, the previous owner also glued small heat sinks on two of the eight memory ICs. However, this one slightly touches the capacitor. It is probably not deadly, but not nice either. The other one is not glued properly. It is tilted to the side and has almost no contact to the surface of the IC. Actually, the DDR2 memory on this card shouldn't get really hot when not overclocked, and such heatsinks are actually not necessary. Furthermore, if they should be necessary, it would be good to cool all of the ICs and not only the two of the eight. As I said, this is how the original cooler looks like on this card. I have no black one, but this silver cooler looks extremely similar. Let's see if I can restore the nearly original look of the card. I am pretty sure that the bigger cooler would normally make a better job, but maybe that's not necessary and it's worth it at least to try to make a single slot card out of it again. Should it get too hot, I still can use a better cooling solution. It is also a good idea to look under the cooler anyway to check the thermal paste, and this one doesn't look very good for me. It didn't dry, in opposite, looks a bit watery. I'm not sure why exactly this happens, but I noticed already a couple of times that if a thermal paste was exposed to cold temperatures, it starts to dissolve and separate in hard compound and some fluid. I think in such case the thermal paste doesn't do a great job anymore and shouldn't be used. I use some IPA a soft toothbrush and a paper towel to clean the card from the old thermal paste. As I said, the heat sinks on the DRAM have barely contact to the ICs, so it's not a problem to remove them with a knife. So, this is the cooler once again. I thought that it would sit like that on the GPU, but I ran into a problem. 
Can you see the gap between the heatsink and the GPU? Unfortunately, there is no contact, so the cooler would not be able to cool the chip like that. The issue is that the standoffs on the cooler, which are also used for the screws, are simply too high. That's a bummer, and I guess I'll have to drop this idea for now and use the other cooler instead, which the previous owner installed on this card. It will still press against the capacitor, but currently I have no other choice, and we'll have to find another cooler which would be a better fit. Well, it still was worth it to remove the cooler at least to replace the thermal paste. By the way, when screwing a cooler onto a GPU or CPU, always start with two opposite screws and fasten them slowly and alternately by hand. This way you will avoid uh, tilting of the cooler and unequal pressure on the IC, which could get cracked otherwise. After that, you can repeat the same on the other two screws, and first, when all screws are in place with equal tension, you can use a screwdriver to tighten them a little bit, but don't overstress it, the GPU is very fragile. Okay, as I said, it's not necessary to glue the heatsinks on the memory ICs, but there is another chip on this card which gets really hot. This IC is called Rialto on ATI graphics cards. It is basically an AGP bridge, which translates the PCI Express bus into AGP. All the later GPUs, like this HD3650, were primarily made for PCI Express, but to be able to use such GPUs on AGP mainboards as well, ATI introduced such a translator chip. NVIDIA cards had a similar solution on their G4 7000 series of cards and called it HSI, if I remember right. But whatever such chips were called, the important thing was that they got very hot. Unfortunately, many graphics cards manufacturers usually saved some cents and didn't install any additional coolers on such ICs. They should survive the guaranteed time, and nobody was interested in a longer life of those products. And though, here we are, the retro enthusiasts still trying to use that old hardware. Well, unfortunately, overheated AGP bridge ICs are the reason number one why the AGP cards of that period died. And if you want it to serve longer, you should equip it with an additional heatsink. I installed one on that other X1650, which I used in the system before, and I'm going to repeat it on this HD3650 card as well. Here is a heatsink which I would like to use. Yeah, something like that. The heatsink has a self-sticking pad underneath, so it can be glued directly to a chip. Unfortunately, there is this pink pad around the die, which is uh, maybe half a millimeter higher than the IC itself. If I just stick the heatsink directly on top of it, this would prevent that the die has a contact to the heatsink. That is uh, not something you would want. The pad itself is just for protection reasons and could be removed, so the heatsink could be glued to the die. However, the surface of the die is very small, and it would make the whole construction kind of unstable, so it's better to keep the pad in place. As you see, the gap to the die is really tiny, probably even less than half of a millimeter. So I'll cut out a small window out of the self-sticking pad on the heatsink, clean everything with IPA, and now I'll use a tiny bit of the heatsink plaster on the die to fill the tiny gap to the heatsink and get the best possible contact. Now I can stick the heatsink directly onto the pink pad and the heatsink plaster should fill all the gaps. Perfect, I guess the card is now ready to run some benchmarks, so we can compare it to the X1615 results. I ran multiple benchmarks, and the whole system turned out to be very stable. On the benchmarks list there were some usual suspects. Quake 2 at 1024 by 768 Of course, 3 Mark 99 at default 800 by 600 at 16-bit colors. The 3 Mark 2001 SE also at default resolution 1024 by 768 at 32-bit colors. The 3D Mark 2003 at 1024 by 768 
And last but not least, Doom 3, also at 1024 by 768 in high quality without anti-aliasing. The built-in time demo of this game was for sure one of the most used benchmarks for a decade and I don't want to miss it in my list of the tests on such a machine. I will not torture you showing all the benchmarks in the real time, but just show you these results. On the left you can see all the runs with the X1650 and on the right with HD3650. Although the overall difference is quite significant, the gain was not distributed equally. For example, in 3D Mark 99 Max, the performance increase was under 3%, so almost no difference. But the newer the benchmark was, the higher relative performance improvement I could measure. In 3D Mark 2001, I got over 16% better values and in 3D Mark 2003, almost 45% improvement. I think this is nothing surprising since the newer benchmarks benefit much more from the newer hardware and features of the HD3650, which the X1650 can't offer. However, the Quake 2 time demo totally surprised me. This game was much older and even the X1650 was by far too new for that game. So like with the 3D Mark 99 Max, I actually didn't expect a huge gain in Quake 2 as well. But boy was I wrong, the performance went from 246 to 433 FPS. That is an increase by over 75%, an unbelievable result. I would be curious to know about your experience with the Quake 2 benchmark and maybe your opinion why this game ran so much faster on the HD3650 compared to the X1650. With Doom 3, on the other hand, the performance gain was with almost 20% back to a reasonable value. I actually expected it to be higher for this game, but maybe we are already limited by the CPU here. As always with such benchmarks, it is an endless cat and mouse race. You are either limited by the CPU or the GPU. Anyhow, I'm very happy with these results. The average performance gain was at almost 30%. Furthermore, the newer HD3650 offers DirectX 10.1, compared with only DirectX 9 on the X1650, which would allow to play games in better quality and get higher performance where newer features are used. But that wasn't everything what made me happy. The X1650 was terribly loud running the fan at full speed all the time, I searched for some tools which I could use to convince the cards to be more silent, but nothing helped and after a while the sound of screaming fan got very annoying. Imagine how glad I was as I discovered that this HD3650 has a fan speed control. Finally I could enjoy a fast and silent Windows XP gaming PC. Uh, well, not quite. If you watched the last part of this video, maybe you remember that the mainboard seems not to provide any CPU fan speed control as well. And so, despite that the graphics card was silent now, the CPU fan kept making me crazy, going with over 3000 RPM with the CPU temperature at 25 degrees Celsius was nothing I could accept. But this is going to be something I would like to address in the next part. And so far, I wish you a blue and peaceful skies. Thank you and goodbye.